South Asia is second only to Scandinavia in having had more women heads of state than any other region in the world. And yet women represent no more than 5 to 10 percent of the central legislatures in South Asia. What explains this dichotomy? Where do women stand in the political process, in nation building, and in fighting terrorism? What challenges do they face? We have a very special guest today to discuss this. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Ms. Mariam Vardak, social and political activist from Afghanistan. Mariam Vardak is a strategic communication and international relations advisor to Afghanistan's national security advisor. Vardak began her career in international affairs at a young age when she traveled from the United States to Afghanistan to assist her father with humanitarian projects. She is also the deputy chairman of Afghanistan Forward, a leading political group for young Afghan professionals. my deepest uh, respects and condolences to our Indian colleagues on the recent event of Polwana. I'm feeling very honored and privileged to be a part of the Wyon Global, Global Summit. I've been invited here to evaluate three specific areas in Afghanistan through the gender lens, which affects the prosperity of Afghanistan and ultimately South Asia. Before I begin, I want to share a piece of history that should resonate with you throughout the rest of my presentation. July 1879, the Second Afghan-Anglo War. The British forces of the 66th Regiment, equipped with modern machinery, encountered Afghan troops under the command of Ghazi Ayub Khan at Maiwand region of Kandahar province. In the ranks of Afghans, amongst them were many women, there to help with the wounded to provide water, spare weapons, and with the wounded. One was Malale, a daughter of a shepherd from a local tribe. Her father and fiancé were also a part of the battle. Fighting intensified, the Afghans were at the bottom of Maiwan Mountain, holding on to their swords, where the enemies were coming down hard. British troops were on the very high morale, which gave them a good chance to advance. Many Afghan fighters are dead, wounded, and the rest facing fatigue. Commander Ayub Khan didn't know what to do. The Afghan flag bearer was killed, and Malala appears in the middle of the battlefield, removing her veil and shouting, Young love, if you do not fall in the Battle of Maiwan, someone is saving you as a symbol of shame. This gave the Afghan warriors a new resolve and redoubled their efforts. She led Afghans to victory. Malala of Maiwan is an icon of braveness. Afghanistan is lucky in this regard, as there are many Malalais amongst us. They just haven't been recognized yet. Now to delve into the first topic, which is the gendered aspect of countering violent extremism. I'm going to provide the general threat environment for Afghanistan for you to get a picture before I go into CVE. Afghan government is currently fighting 20 terrorist groups that come into four distinct but interrelated categories. The Afghan terrorist group, the, re the Pakistan terrorist groups, the regional terrorist groups, and the global terrorist groups. We are combating men with guns on a daily basis. This is at the cost of human lives. President Ghani had recently mentioned that we have lost, since he took office, we have lost 45,000 Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. UNAMA has mentioned that we have lost 30,000 civilian, we have had 30,000 civilian casualties. The picture is more complex than I can describe. We are in a current state of war. We are not making peace with foreign terrorists. We are fighting those Afghans who don't want to reconcile. Violent extremism continues to threaten the stability of Afghanistan and by default is a threat to South Asia and the world. Countering violent extremism is a facet of counterterrorism in Afghanistan. We are the ground zero of the global fight against countering violent extremism. In the context of Afghanistan, there is a lack of knowledge and research regarding CVE and the push and pull factors. In addition, there's a little understanding of women's influence in CVE. 
When I was at the Office of the National Security Council in Afghanistan, two of the four years we conducted field research in seven zones of the country at the district level of what makes an individual join violent organization to fight their own people and their own government. What we found was a host of factors and grievances which make people vulnerable to the ideology of violent extremism. Political, economic, and social factors, eth uh, ethnic, and historical issues. We failed to create a comprehensive profile of an individual vulnerable, and we failed to collect information on women in violent extremism. Should women have a role in countering violent extremism? Absolutely. Women can be powerful preventers and participants in innovative efforts to inform and shape attempts to limit violent conflict. Are women actively involved in violent, countering violent extremism in Afghanistan? No. There are gender stereotypes in Afghanistan which ultimately affects the women's involvement in CVE. It's constantly reinforced. Women are victim, passive, uneducated, individuals that have no role. What is clear is that the construct of disempowered women, of disempowered victims simply do not hold true for all women involved. There is an understanding now that women have moved away from being vi victims of violent extremism. And according to a uh, report in USIP in Afghanistan, some women, there have been witnessed some women have had the role of recruiters, sympathizers, perpetrators, and encourage agents. I'm here to bring attention to the added value women can bring to solutions. How can women counter ideology? Through heavy action-oriented solutions. Women are natural at tackling problems. However, women are excluded from the spaces of solutions, security sector, from intelligent agencies, from governance sector, and major executive roles. Certain number of women that are in various sectors play a more symbolic versus operative role. We were able to grab a selective number of seats at the table, and that was due to the UN Resolution 1325 that highlights the need for women to help the global efforts at resolving violent conflict. The understanding and value of women, the understanding of soft power that is hard work and is long term, is very limited in Afghanistan. There is hard power, the power of the bullet. We have applied it, we are applying it, but we haven't won the battle. We need long-term, cohesive, comprehensive approach to counter violent extremism, but through and with women. There's a lack of communication and dialogue with women. We have yet to ask them, can you do this? Do you have allies? Assess their confidence, listen to their concern, and understand how they are affected. Unfortunately, the government and the parliament of Afghanistan bases their approach on assumptions and have never challenged the rhetoric and position that they have faced. To counter extremism, include, listen, and engage with and through women. Now, the second upcoming industry that women are trying to master in Afghanistan are women in technology, connectivity. Most of us might take it for granted. I know it's underappreciated, but not for the average Afghan woman. Women in Afghanistan are given limited space to feed their curiosity. Society enforces strict restriction for women to have limited access to information. Why? Because it's a way to control them. Luckily, today, that curiosity is fed through a computer, laptop, and a smartphone. All of a sudden, an isolated girl is engaged with the world and has access to unlimited information, exploring the world through a digital mean. Women have a voice, not through sound, but a digital voice. Digital literacy is a vital enabler. From 2005 each year, there is a 0.6 increase to internet use in Afghanistan. Today, we have 10% of girls who have access to the internet from home, a larger number from school, and an even larger number from work. Through technology, we have witnessed how it's reshaped the community's view of a woman. We have Roya Mahboub, the first female tech entrepreneur in Afghanistan, now currently creating a curriculum and structure for the first school of STEM. We have the Code to Inspire, Frishta Farov, that contracts young girls to code from home for projects abroad. About, uh, excuse me, abroad. We have a yoga application by an Afghan girl, Fakhria Ibrahimi Mumtaz. She found her way to the global innovation through science and technology competition in the US. That's at the international level. At the national level, we've had a girl who's attended a course in technology, and she's learned how to do, use a social media platform. And from that, she had expanded her father's business. 
These are just a few numbers. Why is the success for women in tech in Afghanistan so crucial? Because failure is not a luxury for women in Afghanistan. Such as it might be celebrated in the West where you learn, you fail, and you try again. There's no try again option in Afghanistan. They don't want to hear from society, I told you so, you wasted your time. They want to hear, great job, let's hold off your marriage. Great job, let's send your, school to, your sisters to school. Tech entrepreneur spirit is high, and I hope that there's an investment in electricity and education for young women and professionals to thrive in the field. Now the last, which is traditional versus modernity. Where am I? Where are the Afghan women? We are in constant process of modernization. The Afghan culture stresses the concept of honor and gallantry. Patriarchy is a common feature in Afghanistan. We have an invisible battle of religion versus tradition. When women are denied of their rights, they, they, the blame falls upon tradition. In all of your respective countries, you have cultures and traditions that have been passed from one generation to the next. There are old tra tra traditions that we have stopped practicing or it slowly vanished due to the harmful effects it has on society. In Afghanistan, the decline in childhood marriage, the decline in dowry system, eliminating remarriage of widows within the family. When women became widows, they were not to wear color, they were not to wear makeup, stay at home. But that has changed in many of the urban areas of Afghanistan. Our new way today, in the past few minutes of my speech, you can identify examples of how women are striving for modernization to be included, to change, and to improve. In Afghanistan, modernity is due to change that was needed. Afghan women have become change agents of tradition, applying what is beneficial and stopping what is not. A girl getting married because she started her menstrual cycle is not acceptable, not even in the rural area, areas. But the most interesting is of today's time where the discussion of the Taliban coming back into power, the Taliban coming into politics, the Taliban possibly governing. Now I see women social activists starting hashtag, women will not go back. I see women opinion makers on traditional me media talking about the new Afghanistan for women. Women are not allowing anyone to dictate them. They're raising the, their concern and providing areas of which can be compromised and areas of the red line. Now allow me to say, explain a little bit of my phase of tra transition. After 10 years in Afghanistan, I'm focusing now on solutions and uh, not highlighting problems. A lot of my work is around motivating environment and to provide a space of support. Each woman is unique in her own way, as is her life. I have no right to tell them how they should be and should not be. But I and other women have a social obligation to help recognize areas of which they can evolve and in the hopes that through this recognition that they will ask for support on how to express themselves and what they want. I'm not revolutionary, but I believe in conscious evolution. So I'm going to have over. You've told us stories from Afghanistan. I want to ask about your story and why it, it is the story of that fine balance that Afghanistan stands in right now. Well, my story has to do with this obligation that I feel that I have to give back to Afghanistan. Um, and it has to do with my parents, my, mostly my father. Um, he was a humanitarian, a po politician, military man turned humanitarian. And because of the ingrained values of how I need to give back to my community in order to make sure that we will be able to recognize who we are in the future, you, in order to find a balance, I guess, one has to go contribute and give back. You also said that Afghanistan is a fundamentally patriarchal society. And I had a conversation with you earlier, and you said that in some ways you replicate patriarchy. What does that mean? Well, I replicate patriarchal vices through my communication, my attire, and how I interact with the public. And the only reason why I replicate it is in order to find areas of how I can help other females advance. So when I was at the Office of the National Security Council, I 
was very simple in my communication, very quiet. I only listened, provided documents. Um, but however, I was able to identify areas on how I can recruit women. When I first joined, there was only 12 people, at, 12 women at the Office of the National Security Council. When I left, there were 36. So you have to, if you can't beat them, join them, I guess. That's a good philosophy. Uh, the return of the Taliban and their potential rule in, in the days ahead, given the way the peace talks are progressing, you said that Afghan women are not ready to go back. But is there a concern that, first of all, you're not party to conversation or dialogues that are going to impact your lives the most? The Afghan government of the day is not a, a participant in any of the peace talks, whether it be the American-led or the, the Russian-led. And especially women and the youth whose life is going to be impacted if such a regime change happens. Is there, is there a plan B? Is there, is there concern, trepidation in the society about what is coming? Well, just today there was an article in the New York Times by two young Afghan women um, and how they were talking about the, f the spread of fear. I think it's more that we need to hold responsibility and the Afghan people need to demand their government to be a part of any type of discussions. The Afghan people are not, the Afghan women are not the women and the people pre-Taliban period. So it's not this blank slate that you could come and all of a sudden control and operate how you wish. These women, these women men, young individuals are educated. They've, um, they've understood and felt economic autonomy and they've had a taste of freedom. So they're not going to just allow anybody to come there and tell them that this is how you will be, no school, no work, stay at home. There will be a strong rebellious against that. Can you tell us a little more about, about where young Afghans, and especially Afghan women, see themselves in the South Asia story and the growth story that we've been discussing today? I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, the constant process of modernization we're constantly trying to prove ourselves. We're constantly trying to work within the means that we have. Um, and I think that we need to start being more appreciated and we need to also work amongst each other. There's one thing that I've noticed is that there's a lack of sisterhood amongst South Asia. And I feel that if we cannot stand up for one another, we can't ask our brothers to stand up for us. Sure. There's an election coming up. Do you see the participation of women growing in, in the Afghan presidential election? Um, yes, in regards to voters. Um, as earlier, uh, my mom, Zakia, mentioned that uh, we had the largest female participation of voters and candidates for parliamentary, and I think it's going to double when it comes to presidential. Women believe that they have something at stake. They believe that their vote counts. So... And they're actively, I find them more active when it comes to democratic electoral process, more so than the men. How would you look at the next five years in Afghanistan, given that you are the voice of your generation and people like you represent Afghanistan? What are their concerns? What are their fears? What sort of space do they want to claim? In the next five years? Yes. Um, again, the feeling of uncertainty of what's going to happen with the Taliban, what's going to happen, the election is currently postponed for three, four months. So there's discussion that it might be postponed for another two years. The uncertainty um, has everyone a bit quiet. Some are raising their voice and concern. Um, but I feel that if we, if Afghans take ownership and responsibility, the future looks bright. When you take ownership and responsibility, you understand what's happening on your street, in your neighborhood. If there is some sort of activities that are not right, you can report it. Um, if you feel that there's corruption and you want to fight against it, one can't do anything, but the masses can bring upon a change. So I see a sense of responsibility growing, but there's a lack of ownership. If they're able to master that ownership, I think there will be a huge change prosperity for Afghanistan and I think ultimately the region. Your family was forced to move to the U.S. and you came back after a considerable period. What, 
how difficult was it to adapt to the Afghanistan that you saw a few years back? And a lot of water has flown under the bridge. So how do you, how do you describe this evolution of your country and your society? Well, I left when I was extremely young, so I didn't remember it. But I did return during the Taliban era. Um, I was terrified. I was frustrated. My father decided to take me to Afghanistan when I was 15. Um, at 15, I'd like to go to summer camp or get on the internet or watch a movie, hang out with my friends. But my father said, no, nope, you need to go to visit your country and learn, from, uh, learn about your people. So I went. I went in a burqa. I went to a village. And I saw the simple way of life and how content they all were. I learned the value of, of human quality time. I learned their patience and the appreciation that they had for just the simple, simple way of how they were dealing with each other. Um, it, was, it was not easy. I mean, after three months, I did get bored, but it's an excellent period of time for one to visit. Throughout the years, I, I traveled more. But when I officially decided to move to Afghanistan, um, it was during the Karzai era, and I believe it was the golden days. Um, there weren't that many suicide um, or insurgency, and business was thriving. There was contracts. Um, Kabul was not as overpopulated as it is now, and security was fairly good. So it was great, but I noticed a, a decline through the years. Now it's extremely difficult. Now you have barricades of walls so high, you can't see anybody's home. There are security checkpoints at every mile. Um, women are not smiling versus during the, when I first went. They were smiling, walking. Um, there is ridiculous amount of pollution right now in Kabul. Uh, so I guess it's, it's sad to see where it has reached. But there's so many other elements that play into it. I mean, um, we've had uh, the internally displaced come to Kabul. There's, a, there's just so many factors. Um, I guess you, now that I'm reflecting upon it, it's quite sad, but you can only be hopeful. Right. You are involved in a, in a sphere which is, which is largely uncommon. You're talking about secure, the security apparatus and co-opting women in that system. What kind of reactions do you get when you, when you go and try to get more women to participate in this particular aspect of, of your work? Um, again, there's resistance. Uh, when people think about the security sector, they think that, oh, my, if we're trying to recruit women, they're going to think that oh, my daughter's going to be out fighting with other men. Um, you see a lot of the parents and the older generation reject it, but these women, women are phenomenal. They just secretly come join. They have no fear, um, and they have the heart of a warrior. Um, and if they can't take a combat role, they still want to come to the security sector, but in an administrative role. They slowly want to work. I've been in many roundtable discussions where they're like, we want to influence policies. We don't think you're fighting the battle correct. We want to develop the plan for you. And I mean, having that kind of voice and that kind of vision, I mean, I think it's quite inspiring. I see a rejection from, again, from the older generation, but I don't see it from the younger generation. That's a good start, I see. Thank you very much, Mariam, Thank for your so time. Thank you so much for having you're me. You're doing great work. Thanks.